All right, this should be, uh, should be an interesting, interesting talk. Um, my idea was basically, um, you know, I work, uh, I work at Slam Data. I work on an open source project. Um, like, I want to say probably 95% of the work that I do on a daily basis is like completely open source. And it's, it's a database, like it, it does a lot of things. We'll talk about it in a second. So I thought it would be really cool to just kind of like do like a mini little code review. Um, so of course, if this is anything like the code reviews that I do on PRs, we're gonna spend all of our time talking about indentation. Um, <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see like some code and things like that uh, at the same time. And if you're at all interested in database implementations or architecture or uh, what purely functional programming looks like in a very large, very messy, very multi-year sort of tenure and code base, uh, this is a good place to look. Um, please do not judge uh, for the uh, like fact that it's a real world code base and there's a lot of terrible things in there. Uh, but we, uh, we, try to, we try to make sure that those terrible things are not variables. Um, all right, so anyway, this is, the, this is the project URL if you want to grab it or if you want to grab it later or like whatever um, things. All right, what is Quasar? Um, so Quasar is the core of Slam Data. It's, it's really three things. Um, it is a compiler, um, it is a file system, a virtual file system on top of underlying databases, and it is itself also a database, a columnar data store. And we're getting into what all of this means. Um, the compiler is basically split up, I think of it as these sort of five things. Uh, it's got SQL, logical plan, um, QSU, which we're gonna get to in a second, this is the important bit, uh, and then a QScript read and QScript connector. Um, th those are kind of like the five pillars of the compiler. Uh, the file system is just free things, and it's exceptionally boring, like really, really, really boring, um, and, and I want to get rid of it someday. Um, the, we're not going to talk about the file system at all, because it's just like a really boring, like here's some free monads and some co-products and things, and that was all like very 2017. Um, we don't need to hear about that today. Um, the database is also quite cool, and cool for reasons that are unrelated to everything else. Um, so the database has a virtual file system, um, it has a table abstraction, slice, column, and then uh, two separate uh, on-disk file systems which represent the uh, data actually turned into bits. Um, and uh, this is also the oldest part of the code base, and you're going to get to sort of like see archaeology of Scala best practices as we look at that code. Um, generally speaking, you can kind of think of the uh, compiler control flow wise as this, like hierarchically, um, and the database as well in, in terms of hierarchy, like everything just sort of like sits above the other, and the free stuff, no one actually cares. Um, so before we talk about the compiler, we should talk about the language we are compiling, which is something we call SQL squared. It's sort of like a superset of ANSI SQL. Um, I say sort of because it's not actually. Um, we do break compatibility in a couple of really minor areas. You probably would not notice those areas unless I pointed them out, but they are there. Um, mostly we're just actually just trying to look like SQL. Like SQL squared is actually a, a sort of a de novo language. It's based on a formal calculus, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and uh, it's designed to look like ANSI SQL because as it turns out, um, people are really uncomfortable with learning new languages. And you know, if you give someone a language to manipulate data, they want it to be SQL. And if it's not SQL, they just won't even pick up the phone. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to look like SQL and that's basically what SQL squared does. Um, it adds to ANSI SQL um, operations for manipulating structured data. Um, so JSON is basically, or a superset of JSON is kind of the format that we work in. Um, it uh, is referentially transparent, which we should all agree is a good thing. ANSI SQL is not referentially transparent. How many people knew that? Like ANSI SQL not referentially transparent? Like three people, all of which have implemented compilers for query languages. Um, yeah, so uh, SQL squared is referentially transparent and there's actually a number of marvelous things which fall out of this uh, as a language. It also uh, op offers dimensional operations, project, embed, and fold. We will get into what all of this means, um, but this is like kind of the core secret sauce of why SQL squared is actually theoretically interesting um, and why I'm, I'm doing a number of uh, formal mathematical work uh, with it. Um, so speaking of formal mathematical work, this is what it looks like. Um, take notes, there will be a quiz. Uh, None of this is like, none of this is particularly easy to digest, but this is, this is actually all of SQL squared sort of formal calculus that underlies the language. Um, you'll notice that this is quite more precise than uh, what Cod did back in the 1970s because uh, we wanted to be more precise than him. Um, your eyes can glaze over here. The one thing that's actually interesting on this slide is see those angle brackets like that are in all the tuples, like the angle brackets, the vectors, I sub one, I sub two, et cetera, et cetera. All right, 
if instead of having all of those i's, if instead you either had the empty vector or just i sub one, and then, you know, so singleton vector or empty vector, then what you would get is the relational algebra. Like Cod's relational algebra just pops out of this. Um, the fact that we have a multidimensional vector is what makes this a multidimensional relational algebra, and it's what's actually theoretically interesting about SQL squared. Um, so implementing this, it turns out, is extremely hard, um, but it looks like kind of pretty on the screen. Here's an example of SQL squared query. So again, we're just like motivating, getting the juices flowing, uh, hopefully keeping people awake um, until we are actually going to dive into code. This is a SQL squared query. It looks a lot like SQL, as I promised. Um, there's a couple of things that seem a little bit weird, like that weird sort of square bracket underscore thing that looks like it came from Scala programmers. Um, and then we've got, you know, sort of nested reductions. That's a bit weird. But this is actually a query that does something interesting. Um, and we would apply it to a data set that looks kind of like this. This is like some JSON. You notice that loc, the loc field here is an array. Um, so, you know, we're doing something with structured data, um, you know, in this, in this query. And I'm going to tell you right now that what this query does is... It groups everything by state, and so within each state bucket, this is a database of zip codes, so it groups all the zip codes by state, and within each state bucket, it will then uh, dimensionally project the contents of a loc array, and then take the average of the latitude and longitude for each zip code, and then it will find the minimum uh, sort of average of those two for each state. So if you kind of puzzle through this a little bit, you'll realize that what we're actually looking for is zip codes that are really far west and really far south, because those are the things that are going to be like sort of the smallest uh, things. And lo and behold, that's more or less what we get. Like California gets like a smaller number than Arizona and Colorado and, uh, you know, whatever AR is. I, I don't know. I think that's Arkansas or something. Uh, no one cares. Um, that's, that's like <laughs> further... Further east and further north or some permutation too. This is kind of a weird query, but it, it suffices for the example, right? This is something that you really can't do in ANSI SQL. Um, is this kind of this kind of dimensional project and then you know rotating it and, and folding it together with a monoidal uh, collapse, which is what average and, and min are. Um, so the way that this works is with the compiler. So this compiler is going to take care of uh, recognizing the SQL syntax, or the SQL squared syntax, rather, um, ascribing meaning to it, um, planning this query, optimizing it, trying to make sure that things are as, as sort of pared down as possible, and then representing it in some intermediate form that we can then evaluate relatively easily on various databases, including our own, the one that's built into Quasar. Um, so again, like I said, sort of these five pillars. and. Um, the, the sort of uh, pillars are basically divided by QSU, um, which does not stand for QScript University, but it really should. Um, the, uh, the pillars that are on the left um, work with it in a representation which I call syntactically directed, all right? So it's basically very close to SQL, it's sort of recognizably the syntax of the SQL you wrote, um, and you know, maintaining all of the quirks like, I mean, think about SQL, it's not an expression-oriented language, right? You've got like this random group by over here, and then maybe you've got some order by, and then like you put, put subqueries, and the subqueries have to go over there. Like that's really confusing, and it doesn't actually, like, you can't really substitute values in there or anything like that. Um, so we have to parse this, we have to process it, but at some point we have to convert from that to a more flow-directed form, which is expression-oriented and can be interpreted in a relatively straightforward way, and you have this nice tree that you can traverse. Um, and all of that stuff that we would need to actually evaluate it on a real database. Um, QSU is the inflection point uh, between these two. And QSU itself is actually broken down into a ton of different phases. This is actually like the core of the compiler here. This is not even all of the phases. Like I realize this is actually hard to read. Don't worry about it. You don't have to read it. Um, like this is, this is like just like a couple of the major phases inside of QSU. There's a ton more. Um, and uh, lots and lots and lots of stuff happens in here. But one of the interesting stuff that happens in here is that provenance happens. Uh, provenance is a type system that we apply to um, SQL squared, sort of completely transparently to the user, and it allows us to infer a lot of this formal calculus uh, so we don't have to have it at runtime. Um, all of this is super interesting. Uh, come up and see me later because we won't be able to spend tons and tons of time on it, but like, I could talk for like years about, about the compiler. It's really, really fun. Um, all right. So some quick examples, just again, get the juices flowing, just so that we know what we're looking at, right? Because I find that understanding code means understanding data, and understanding data means understanding the data structures and what they constrain, what you can and cannot do with them. So this is the SQL data structure. It's literally an AST. 
Um, this is rendered using the show instance that we have for, uh, for the SQL AST. Nothing, I, like I print lined this, uh, nothing particularly exciting here. And you notice that it basically just follows the structure of the query, right? We've got a select clause, we're projecting for, uh, you know, state, and we're also projecting like min of average of, you know, some shift thing of loc or something like that. Like this is basically what we would look at. Again, not an expression oriented thing. Like group by is not an expression, but clearly it affects all of the rest of this. So, you know, we have to be a little bit careful about that. Logical plan is the second thing that happens. Now we're starting to get a little bit bigger, a little bit harder to read, especially for people in the back. Don't worry about it. Um, this is still a syntactically directed form. Like, it's starting to get a little bit further and further away from SQL because we've got let bindings and sort of references to them. And, but you notice this, like the group by thing, the group by is still kind of hanging off the edge like some sort of weird, like, you know, appendage. It's not, it's, it's not, you know, part of the expression in any meaningful way. We're not, we're not putting it into there. And in, in fairness, like, if you've ever tried to make a query language where grouping is an expression-oriented thing, you know that that's incredibly difficult to do, and, like, users generally just don't understand it. But, like, SQL, SQL does a particularly egregiously poor job at this. Anyway, uh, logical plan. This is the last time we're going to see something that is syntactically directed. Everything after that is going to start looking more like control flow, because now we move into QSU, which is this inflection point. And QSU looks like this. Good luck reading it. Um, you'll notice it's not a tree anymore. So QSU actually is a graph representation. And we need this because fundamentally query, like query evaluation is a graph. You know, you're dealing with sort of this subset of the data and this subset of the data, these projections, and you're bringing it back together again. You have to talk about these little diamonds that you can maybe collapse together when you do planning. We'll talk about all that stuff. Um, but in order to do that, we really do need a, a sort of graphish representation. This is the first stage of QSU. And then a miracle happens, and then finally we get the last stage of QSU, which is even harder to read. Don't even try. Um, but you'll notice it's fewer lines, so presumably we simplified it. Um, <laughs> once QSU is done with things, now we get into QScript. And I'm cheating here because this, this query is actually quite long uh, when we compile it, because QScript can't represent a, a certain operation that we really need here. But um, the, there's more stuff down below the screen. But this will just kind of give you a flavor of what QScript looks like, right? So it's a different sort of tree. You notice we don't have group by hanging around anymore. And what it's doing is it's saying, okay, the root of the tree is a join, which maybe seems weird because we don't actually have join in the query, but I promise there is a join here. Um, and it says join, and then we've got like a map node. This is like a functional map, you know, sort of transform the data one row at a time. And there's a read. It's, it's a shifted read. I don't know what shifting is, but like, I guess reading is good. So there's the data set. And like, you can really read this as like, each, each node will evaluate to some data set, and then that goes into the other, into the other nodes of the tree. Um, you also notice like down at the bottom, we've got reduce, reduce, shift. Well, that kind of looks like our query, right? Expression oriented, we've got a reduce and a reduce, and then a shift that's inside of it. So this is our data structure. Um, and this is kind of what we're going for. This is the thing that we hand to a database. And I can tell you from experience that implementing this in terms, in, on top of a database is actually relatively straightforward. It's basically just going to tell me exactly what to do. I walk the tree. I interpret it into some sort of underlying structure that my underlying database is going to deal with. Um, and it's, you know, I have no decisions to make whatsoever. Um, all of the internals, all of the weirdness of, you know, MRA and, and, you know, SQL squared are completely handled for me. And I don't have to worry about ANSI SQL syntax or anything stupid like that. So, let's open our editor. Um, go forth and, go forth and edit. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to exit out of this and move over to Sublime. All right. Um, I'm sure uh, Stallman would be very happy with that choice. Um, <laughs> So, so we're going to start. We're going to start from the very top, um, and the top is basically the SQL AST, right? So we're just going to kind of look at how this works. And you notice we've got like you know sort of uh, operators and things. I don't know. Don't be don't be scared off by Unicode because you're going to see a lot of it. Um, so basically, uh, the SQL AST. Let's look at select. All right. So select is down here. The SQL AST just kind of looks like this. Um, you know, this is pretty. So is the font size good for everybody? No. Increasing font size. Is the font size good for everybody? I might be able to switch to a light background. Does anybody know how to do that? Uh, let's see here. Color scheme. Select color scheme. That looks promising. Um, material light. Is this, is this okay? We'll go with it. Um, the other, the other color scheme is like one that I've tweaked to be better for Scala, so it'll be interesting to see Scala through not tweaked eyes. Um, all right, so uh, 
Okay, so this is, this is very similar to the example of the tree printout that we saw earlier, where it was just like a select node, uh, and then you know, we had you know, some projections on top of it, uh, you know, relation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you notice one thing that's a little bit strange here is that you would sort of expect you know, something like filter, for example, right? So this is probably gonna happen whenever we have like a select foo from bar where, you know, baz, right? You know, some baz equals bin or something, right? Quarks. Um, so uh, we would sort of expect this right here, this is gonna be like the thing that instantiates into this option, right? That's gonna be that A. And so you would normally expect that, oh, you know, this should be, this should be a SQL, right? This should be a subtree. Um, we're not doing that. Uh, so this AST is represented as a pattern functor. Um, for those of you who've kind of looked at recursion schemes at all, this will be kind of a familiar idea. But basically, rather than having like a direct recursive subtree, we actually just have an A, right? So all of these nodes have A's in them, and that A, you know, will be another SQL, presumably at some point, um, but uh, it isn't right now. And that allows our, our structure to be very first order. There's a lot of nice properties which come out of that, um, but this is kind of the first step to being able to use recursion schemes through a tool like Matryoshka. Um, all right, so, so this is select, select in the AST. What we do with this is we feed it into um, the uh, logical plan compiler. We turn, we turn SQL into logical plan. Um, I don't know why it's called compiler. It doesn't really compile anything. It just like does a little bit of rearrangement of the tree and calls it a day. Um, but basically, um, compile is gonna take a co-expert. That sounds scary, co-things. Oh crap, co-free. Okay, well co-free I guess is a thing. Um, so co-free is gonna be instantiating the pattern functor with a particular shape. Um, and partic in particular, what we're doing here with Cofree is we're attributing the SQL AST, which is sort of like, now we're, we're taking this pattern functor and we're filling in these A's with things that are not just, you know, more SQL subtrees. Um, and the, the, what we're attributing it with are annotations. So the idea is that, well, we're gonna go over the tree before we feed it into this compile not function, and we're gonna try to figure out certain properties of this that maybe we can use in the second pass over the tree when we, when we do compile not. This is a very, very common pattern in compilers. We're not gonna spend a ton of time dwelling on this, but just index in your brain. Compiler, attributing tree, co-free. Boom. All right, so we feed it into compile not, and compile not does like, uh, you know, kind of a lot of boring things where it's like, oh, we have to know that like this name corresponds to this function. And I don't know, I guess apparently SQL has like a million different names for the same function. And you know, stuff like that and you know, things in here. Okay, all that is really boring. All right, that's the SQL compiler, more or less. If you wanna find out more about it, again, like look at the code base because we're gonna, we're gonna be jumping around pretty fast here. All right, compiler. Um, compiler goes into logical plan and logical plan looks more or less like this. Um, so here's the root of the logical plan uh, hierarchy, extends product with serializable because we're in Scala. Um, and uh, the nodes in logical plan are also pattern functors, just the same way as they were in the SQL AST, right? So like, this is gonna be a very, very familiar recurring pattern. Like, this is just how we represent recursive data in Quasar. Um, you know, whenever you wanna use logical plan. So this is gonna have nodes like invoke, right? So invoke takes some sort of shapeless nat, and this allows us to invoke, you know, an entry function in principle. Uh, it's always gonna be like, you know, arity zero, one, two, or three. Um, so an entry function um, on some, some values of type A. Um, we're gonna have, you know, a join. So we didn't actually see a join in our query, but we do have joins, inner, outer, you know, sort of full outer, that sort of thing. Um, and these joins are gonna have, you know, a left side and a right side uh, and a type, and then they're gonna have a join condition, which is like another sort of recursive A. And again, like we're not embedding logical plan within logical plan, we're just like doing the pattern factor thing where like every time we would have had recursion, we just have an A, okay? Everybody cool so far? If there are any questions at any time, shout. Um, it's also like very difficult for me to see people in the back, so if you raise your hand and I ignore you, it's not because I hate you, um, I just probably didn't see you. Um, okay, so logical plan. Um, log there's not a lot of interesting things to say about logical plan, because honestly it's kind of a residual uh, leftover of like an older architecture that Quasar had. You know, this is just like basically any code base that's been around for a few years, like going through to sort of like archeology span of partially completed refactorings. Um, this, is, this is definitely one of those times. Um, so logical plan is kind of an artifact. Um, there's very, very few important things that happen there. Type checking is one of them, but type checking is not what you think it is. It's actually something much more boring. So just generally speaking, not actually interesting. Um, moving on, QSU, remember? Uh, so LP to QS is the root of QSU. Um, so if you're looking for a query planner inside of Quasar, this is where you look. Because everything else is just sort of trappings around this. 
Um, so LP to QS um, is basically effectively a giant function um, created with Claisley composition of like a lot of different things um, that uh, goes from logical plan to QScript. And then along the way, it's going to do some incremental transformations. So, um, you know, each of the phases is going to be something like, you know, read LP and like do like some little like pattern recognition and rewriting or something like that. Recognize distinct or something like that. Um, and then we can have like some interesting stuff. We can sort of compute type information. Uh, we can try to make joins go away. That seems like an important thing to do. Um, and then finally, uh, graduation day, and we turn ourselves into QScript. Um, so, uh, uh, we also have print lines in here because we're cool and we're functional programmers. Um, so the, uh, uh, right, um, so how does this, how does this look exactly? Well, let's look at, let's look at read LP as an example because this is where everything just sort of comes in. Um, by recursive T, by the way, is like, when you see this, just think to yourself, Matryoshka magic. Um, but it basically just means T is a fixed point um, that's going to sort of represent how our data is recursive. And there are many different fixed points that you could use. Um, so uh, Matryoshka magic, great. All right, so what does is, what is read LP do? Well, we look at the apply function. The apply function has like all these monadic constraints and the types are very hard to read. Um, but basically it's saying within some monad, uh, take a fix of logical plan, so T of logical plan, um, and then turn it into a QSU graph. Well, what the heck is a QSU graph? Well, we're gonna find that out. But what's more interesting than that right now is how we're turning it into a QSU graph, which is with kata M, all right? This is recursion schemes. Um, so this is a tiny little baby recursion scheme that you will use probably like 10 to 20 times more than all of the other ones put together, but uh, Kata M is super, super nice. Um, and uh, what this allows us to do is very similar to like a fold on a list or something like that, where you think about a list, a list has like multiple things inside of it, right? When you fold it down to one thing, you just like sort of ka-chunk, 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 right? You're done? Uh, so Kata M is kind of the same idea, right? Where you've got this tree, sort of this fixed point structure tree, and you're gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go all the way down to sort of the leaves, and you're gonna like turn them into like one thing and like progressively reduce it together until you have one thing at the end and you've uh, sort of finished off your tree. Um, so what Kata M does is it will lift an algebra um, to operate over this fixed point structure um, just in the same way that fold left lifts a function to operate over your list, right? Um, so the algebra in question, now an algebra in this context just is like a fancy word for a function. Um, so uh, in the algebra in this sense is uh, basically just gonna go from each of the logical plan nodes. So here's a read node in LP, here's a constant node. So like if you said 42, it'd probably be here. Uh, you know, a million different types of invocations because logical plan map, like turns everything into invoke. Um, and then, you know, other sort of nodes down here. So all the different types of logical plan nodes and it's gonna turn them into QSU graph nodes. So um, the logical plan node is, uh, or the, the LP read node is kind of interesting um, because uh, it's actually gonna turn into multiple QSU nodes. Um, but by, by and large, it's just basically like a relatively direct mapping. Like we're just taking this tree, this recursive tree structure, this logical plan, and we're, we're turning it into um, sort of the, this graph structure that we're gonna manipulate um, in a little bit. Um, one thing that is really, really, really cool about recursion schemes, all right, so when you're actually working with these things, one thing that is fantastic, let's go to join, uh, lp.join, here it is. Um, so lp.join right here. Um, so this is the case where we're reading a, a logical plan join node. Um, and you notice we've got these sort of left and right things. Uh, and remember like when we were looking at the logical plan node, these were A's, okay? So it was a, you know, the join of A is the left is an A, the right is an A, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just to be clear so that we're all on the same page, uh, join is, Join is right here, right? So left and right, these are A's, okay? So anyone wanna take a guess as to what this A is instantiated into inside of this algebra? Like what could the A possibly be? Anyone know? It could be logical plan, like another subtree, but because of the magic of recursion schemes, it's actually just going to be a QSU graph. Like the thing that we're trying to turn logical plan into is the thing that's gonna get shoved into our holes, like as we sort of see each node, the results of the children are gonna be right there for us to grab. Um, so this is actually a tremendously convenient thing um, about folding over data structures and, and one of the things that recursion schemes get you, gets you basically for free. Um, so we're gonna turn join into QSU LP join. So I think about this time we should look at what QSU graph looks like because QSU graph is presumably the thing that we're creating here. Um, and lo and behold, it actually looks like something terrible. So this symbol here is not like fancy sort of purely functional symbol. This symbol is like scala.symbol. Okay, you know the thing that was built for Rubyists that no one actually uses? Yeah, we use it. 
Um, so, uh, so, so, so this is the root of the graph. Um, and then we have like this vertices thing. And this vertices, QSU vert, is apparently a map from symbol to like this thing called QScript uniform of symbol, which sounds terrifying. Um, and, it, and it should be terrifying. Um, because this is basically like the only way we could think of to represent a graph that had the properties that we want. Um, so working with this data structure is quite painful, um, which is why we've derived a number of combinators for it. So when we work on top of QSU graph, we're working in terms of things like fold map. And you know, rewrite m is a, a really incredibly useful function. It basically lifts a, a function from graph to graph um, and you know, lifts it up to operate over the entire graph. Um, this, is, uh, this is basically how we interact with QSU graph. We try really, really hard not to write manual code that's like taking symbol and indexing into a map and then throwing away exceptions when bad things happen. Um, you know, we don't want to do any of that. So again, like common, common theme here, right? Like if there's a right way to do something, we're going to try to do it that way. This is, this is a purely functional code base. We're not, you know, using mutability. We're not, you know, doing control flow with exceptions or anything like that. We're trying to do things the right way. Um, but sometimes the data structures we need are just very difficult to represent in this more conventional sort of tree and ADT and, you know, sort of fixed point combinator uh, approach, which is why we're not using Matryoshka here. Um, very, very, very quickly, uh, the whole reason that we can't use uh, trees for QSU um, is because QSU is going to do a lot of uh, sort of comparisons uh, between like subgraphs and things like that. And it's going to do a lot of things where it's like, oh, I've got this subgraph here and this subgraph here, and they're maybe connected by some sort of shared parentage. Can I walk up the graph and find what their least shared parent is? Doing that sort of thing requires comparisons between subgraphs. Anyone who's like built a compiler knows that comparing subtrees is this thing that you do a lot, and you have to make it very, very, very fast. So um, we have some queries that when we were doing this by comparing subtrees rather than sort of working with graphs, they would take literally hours to compile. And then when we converted it into this QSU graph format where we can do sort of subgraph comparisons just by looking at the symbols, um, now those queries compile in milliseconds. So multiple orders of magnitude win. Um, and you know, when you're dealing with a compiler for a query language, like people just don't expect the compiler to take that much time for some reason. Um, oh yeah, wart remover prevents us from doing recursion. Um, okay, um, right, we're gonna like motor through QSU really, really fast because we're running out of time. Um, lots of interesting stuff in here. So like if you, if you look up one file in Quasar and then use that as your starting point, LP to QS is definitely where I would look because this is the basis of the query pattern. And inside of LP to QS, by far I think the most interesting file is like minimize auto joins because this is basically where we're trying to make sure that all of the crazy sort of semantics that came from that formal MRI calculus are actually able to be represented without like taking a million years when evaluated on your database. Lots of stuff like that. Um, and then finally, we get to uh, graduate. Graduate turns us into QScript. Um, QScript, basically, you know, we've seen, let's see, QScript. QScript typing, uh, core.scala, all right. QScript, like this is again a fixed point uh, algebra, but it's like a much more simple thing. So um, it's designed uh, to be something that we can hand to databases. Databases can evaluate it relatively straightforwardly. So we've got like a standard functional style map. Um, we've got, you know, left shift as an operation. We've got reductions uh, are a thing. Sorting is a thing, stuff like that. All of that is represented in a very sort of, you know, nice expression oriented uh, tree-ish functional way. And all of the graph and symbol stuff is behind us at this point. Now, um, something really, really, really cool that I want to call out here. This thing right here, free map, free map. Well, if you think about a functional map operation, right, um, conceptually what you would have is the target of the map, so the FA in a functor. Um, well, that's going to be some recursive tree, so it's going to be an A, since we're representing this as a pattern functor. Um, and then you would have the function, the function that you're applying over every element of you know, whatever you're mapping over. And in this case, what we're mapping over is a data set. So every element of that data set is going to be a row. So this, this function is presumably some function on rows that we're lifting up to be a function on data sets, right? So how do we represent a function on rows? Clearly not as a Scala function, because we're trying to like make something that's evaluable on a database. So Scala functions are a bad abstraction to use. Uh, pro tip, tell the Spark people this. Um, so uh, FreeMap is, FreeMap is the abstraction that we work with. And FreeMap is super, super cool. Because FreeMap is nothing other than a pattern functor, map func, okay, thrown into the free monad. 
Now, most of the time, when we see the free monad, we're used to thinking of it in terms of DSLs, right? In terms of programs that we're writing for later interpretation. And that is a very useful application of the free monad. Here, we're not writing a program that we're interpreting later. Instead, we're using free as a fixed point operator. Because we're thinking about the structure of the data. And what is the structure of free? Well, it's just a recursive fixed point where at each tier, you have an either. And either you have more free or you have the end, right? Like whatever data is inside of you, your whole, okay? And the shape of each tier is determined by the pattern functor. So the pattern functor map func is gonna be one of these tree structures that we've been seeing so far, where it's things like, uh, well, it's like, uh, hmm, let's look at object concat. Well, map func unfortunately is a, Map func is unfortunately a, uh, a more complicated thing, um, but uh, map func core, which is inside of it, is like, uh, well, let's look at static array or something like that. Um, so map func uh, is gonna have like a number of things that are like this, which are just like, these are like little functions that you can imagine calling on things, like addition, right? So here's addition, the addition operation that might be performed on, on rows, or like, you know, greater than, equal to, uh, project key, project index, concat maps. These, these are all like operations that you can imagine performing on row level data, right? So, but these are all like individual operations. And fundamentally what we want to represent is a tree of these individual operations. A tree of these individual operations parameterized by some input. What is that input? That input is the row. So free fits into this really, really nicely because the uh, free will give us sort of this recursive tree structure. And at each tier, either we have more free trees underneath us or we got to the end, in which case we have our input, which is the row. And so the row will be input at all of the leaves, things aggregate back up together again, and you have a function on rows. So this is like a really, 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 really cool application of the free monad. Um, and it's one of those things that falls out very nicely when you're using recursion schemes. So seeing free as a fixed point data structure um, on top of some pattern functor. So map func, if you're looking through the Quasar code base, map func is a really, really cool thing to look at. All right. So we probably have absolutely no idea how the compiler works, but it doesn't matter because we have a database to look at. Um, so coming back to Stallman, um, moving forward, what does the database look like? So the database is this thing. Uh, was, were there any questions on that incredibly whirlwind and hand wavy tour? Cool, I'm gonna generate more questions. Um, the database, so the database um, is uh, basically the oldest part of the code base, um, and it, it comes from the old precog startup. And uh, we generally call it Mamir for reasons of uh, Chris Nuttycomb. Um, but anyway, the, uh, uh, the database is basically comprised of these things that I talked about. And, and basically, the, the virtual file system is responsible for mapping paths to tables. Um, tables are nothing other than an effectful stream of slices. So remember, we're still a purely functional code base, right? We're trying to represent the concepts of a database in terms of purely functional abstractions like streams. So we have an effectful stream of slices. It's lazy. It's not in memory, because obviously a table could be huge. Slice, well slice is like part of a table. So it's a subset of a table, maybe you know, 10,000 rows, something like that, something that fits in memory. And it's gonna be an integer size and a map from paths to columns. Now this is not paths in terms of like file system paths. This is paths like JQ paths, right? Basically paths into a JSON data structure. So not only the path, but also the type. We map from paths to columns, each column is monotyped. So this allows us to do some really, really interesting things because now our columns can be basically just a very, very homogeneous structure. We can work with things in terms of a single type. So rather than worrying about row level data structures where we have, where we have like the first row, the first column of the row has an integer in it, and the second column of the row has a string in it, and we're trying to maintain a sequence of these things, that's a pain. We just have like a giant column of strings and then a giant column of integers and then a giant column of booleans and marry them all together. Um, and that turns out to be a very, very elegant way of representing things. It also makes certain types of analytic queries very fast. So columns are going to be a partial function from row index to unbox primitive value. Um, so we're not going to do any boxing at all at this layer because remember that boxing on the JVM is incredibly expensive. Um, yes? How do you take care of inconsistencies if the lengths of the sequences differ? Excellent question. Um, basically, what this is getting at is heterogeneous data, right? Like, how do you represent that? You know, maybe your maybe you know your column, uh, you, you've got some foo, you've got a foo column and a bar column, and some rows don't have foos, right? So like things might be at the end. We take care of that in this column function. So column is a partial function from row index to unbox primitive value. So if you are at a row that doesn't have a value, your define this function is going to return false. And then you know, if I ask you for the value anyway, the result is just undefined. 
So that's how, we, that's how we represent this. So again, there's no boxing, there's no optionality here. We represent it as two function, is defined and apply. And I'll show you that. Um, but this allows us to keep primitives very, very, very fast. Um, and then finally, at the bottom layer, we have uh, JDBM, which is a terrible data store, don't talk about it, and NDDB, which stands for Not Inventive Here Database. Um, and uh, uh, NDDB is exceptionally cool. It's basically a packed binary column store, kind of a brainchild of uh, uh, Tom Switzer, uh, Chris Nettycomb, Derek Chen Becker, and uh, Eric Osheim. And uh, this is still like a really, really neat piece of technology uh, underlying sort of all of this. It's a binary representation of slices on disk. Um, so when we, when we talk about the effects that are in the effectful stream of slices, the effects are probably reading files, right? Reading the files out of NDDB and like getting a slice. And once you're finished processing that slice, you throw it away and then you get the next slice, right? So you keep things out of memory um, while still keeping things exceptionally fast. This model is a very important thing to have in your mind. So when you think about functional programming on the JDM, one of the things that a lot of people talk about is, oh, well, there's so many allocations, there's so much immutability, we're like, you know, making all this garbage data, we know that the JVM doesn't deal particularly well with garbage data, so it must be very slow, right? And the answer is yes, functional programming can be very, very slow. Don't do it in places where you care about it being slow. How do you do that? You divide things into um, chunks, right? So here we're dividing things into chunks. Remember, our chunk is basically a slice, a slice of rows, like 10,000 rows. We can do whatever we want, hit any performance penalties we want, as long as it's once every 10,000 rows. Because no one cares, right? Like, even if you have a large enough data set where there's a lot of chunks of 10,000 rows, people still expect that to be quite slow. Um, but as long as we're not paying the performance penalty of like crazy allocations and boxing and like, you know, immutable data structures and things like that at the level of each row, the performance is gonna be fine. So all of the performance penalties are at the level of table and sort of around slice. Inside of slice, we have these individual columns and once we start getting down to the row level, there's no more boxing, there's no more functional programming, it's all while loops and bit shifts and other horrible, 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 nasty things. But we can hide it in this hierarchy and keep things pure and composable. This is the trick. This is how you make functional programming fast on the JVM. And actually, honestly, on every platform. Like, this is what you do. Functional programming in the large, imperative programming in the small. Literally the opposite of what everyone says you should do. So, who is ready for some cake pattern? Yay! Uh, no. Um, Mamir is very cakey, uh, which basically comes from the fact that most of it was written about six years ago. Uh, so, I apologize for the code you're about to see. Um, we're gonna see it anyway. Um, and we are rapidly running out of time, so we're gonna just look very, very quickly. So, table, all right? So we're gonna look at table. Table like, well this is apparently a trait because we're in the cake pattern, so we're gonna have to figure out where the implementation is. Um, I'm, I'm cheating because I know where the implementation is. Columnar table. Columnar table is here. All right, columnar table is exactly what I said it was. It is a stream T M of slice. Who remembers stream T? Runar and like, like a couple of people. All right, um, stream T is what we had in the dark ages before we had FS2. Um, we should replace it with FS2, but we haven't done so yet. Um, it's kind of terrible, don't use it. It's still in Scala though. Um, but basically, stream T of slice, okay? So this is a lazy, effectful stream of slices. The effect that we're running in is M. We don't know what M is, but spoiler alert, it's future, don't judge me. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so <laughs> that is also on the to-do list to fix. Speaking of giant mountain of technical debt in real world code base. Um, all right, slices, what is a slice? Slice is apparently like a nickel thing, but if I go to the correct slice, it's gonna be this trait. And this trait represents it exactly what I says it, said it did. It has a size in it, um, and it has a column map. And that column map is literally a Scala map from column reference, which is like JQ path into some JSON data, right? Like, you know, some field dereferences, some array dereferences, and then a type at the end of it um, to a column, right? Well, what is a column? You said we would talk about that? Here it is, column. Column has, apparently, one function on it, is defined at. Given a row offset, which is an integer, return a Boolean which says whether or not you are defined at this particular row. Um, you notice what we haven't applied here, it, or defined here, is the apply function. You'll also notice that this is column and not column of A, right? We would normally think of this as column of A, but the problem is if you make it column of A, that means boxing. We can't have boxing. So instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna manually specialize. So we have column, we also have long column. So long column extends column and adds this apply method. So given a row offset, 
give me the long value which is at this row. And if, if you're undefined for this row, well, uh, I don't know, divide by zero, do something crazy. Um, so this is how all of the columns are defined. So we have a long column, a double column, a number column which contains big decimals, we have a string column, we've got various forms of date columns. Oh, this is an older branch. Um, empty array is apparently, uh, you know, a, a value and things like that. This is how all of this gets defined. So array long column is basically the root of all of it. Um, so, array, or one of the roots of all of it, right? So if we have an array long column, this is kind of what's gonna get read off of disk. So we're gonna read the bits off of disk that represent a very long sort of 10,000 row column that's all gonna be long. And maybe there's some holes in this column, so we have to worry about the defineness, which is gonna be represented by a bit set, but the values that are in here are just gonna be thrown into an array of longs. This is obviously like, and that's a mutable bit set, by the way. We don't ever mutate it, but it is a mutable bit set. Um, so all of this is like fairly ugly code, right? Like we're gonna be working in terms of while loops and mutations and things like that, but we are abstracting it all behind this column abstraction, which gets hidden behind slice, which gets hidden inside table, and so it all becomes very purely functional and composable. So functional programming in the large, comparative programming in the small. Um, yes? Benefit of matching in terms of like 10,000 outweigh the benefit from like uh, cash locality? Uh, does the performance benefit? Yes. Um, so cash locality is a really important thing. But the thing is that cash locality only applies to uh, data sets up to a certain size. Um, like with L3 caches, you have, it's, it becomes a little more difficult to reason about, but back in the golden era when all we had were L2 caches, you would generally think of things in relatively small sizes that could fit in a cache line, especially once you obfuscate through the JVM's heap. Um, so as an example, now this, it's very difficult to give concrete like unambiguous answers on this, but like one of the things to think about is that closure's persistent vector, like it's you know sort of persistent vector try thing. Um, one of the things that Rich Hickey found is that the optimal size of the arrays, sort of the optimal size of each tier of the try, um, in order to uh, maximize L2 cache locality was just 32. We're dealing with arrays of size 10,000 here. So our cache is just like completely blown. Um, and we're gonna be either in the L2, uh, L3 cache, or like we're gonna be sitting in memory or uh, you know, maybe we're gonna be paging on that cache, something like that. Um, so you can generally tweak these sizes a little bit, um, but broadly speaking, yeah, cache locality is not, not something we have to worry about at the size of uh, slices. It's okay for us to page at that level. Great question, fantastic question. Uh, anybody else have a question? Okay, um, we are rapidly running short on time. Um, so I am going to uh, just jump to one last thing, which is like a route for exploration. You can see some actors because that's what I want to see. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is a really old part of the code base. Um, but basically, uh, NeedyB is, the root of NeedyB is defined here, okay? So this is the NeedyB uh, class uh, that defines the NeedyB actor, exactly what I wanted. Um, and this gives us things like insert a batch of JSON, you know, into, into NeedyB and do something with that. You know, get a snapshot inside of future, yay. Um, get the length of, uh, of a particular data set off of disk, mind you. Um, and get blocks, right? So get, uh, get a bunch of blocks. Each block is going to be a slice. So when we create a table from a needy B sort of persisted uh, collection, what we're going to do is we're just going to sort of get each block in sequence until we can't get any more blocks. And the action of getting those blocks, so literally future of option, this is going to be the effect that's inside of our effectful stream of slices. So everybody kind of see how that's tied together? And needy B actually defines how the individual bits are stored on disk and defines sort of primitive IO readers for this stuff and like all sorts of really ugly IO twiddly code that's actually kind of cool because it's really, really, really fast. Um, all right, so we have two minutes and 40, well, 30, no, 36 seconds left. Um, so uh, in two minutes and now 30 seconds, uh, does anybody have any questions about what you've seen? Is there anything that you wanted to see that I haven't shown you? Which IO type is that? Future. Oh, you mean the other one? Oh, Scala Z6 IO. Wow. <laughs> this, is, um, this is monumentally old code. Um, it, that, that's why there's IO and future at the same time. Yes? What scale of data do you consider a sweet spot for this? So this particular database um, is constrained to a single node. Um, we don't have clustering put in place yet. There's plans for it. That pretty naturally constrains us to a, like a reasonable size. Um, I generally think about it as pretty good for about one to two terabytes at the most. Um, it's better if you can go to smaller sizes than that, but better in the sense that, you know, it's just linearly faster, right? 
we have run it on data sets that are like a terabyte in size and it performs pretty reasonably. Um, so it's the, this whole thing is very well optimized for uh, sort of linear data sets, um, especially because you're, you're dealing with sort of columnar data. So when everything can be stored together and sort of read off the disk in a very linear fashion, it doesn't matter if you have platters or SSDs, that's gonna be really, really fast. Much better than sort of random access jumping around. Other questions right there? Um, one quick thing is with some of the things that you did, like having column not use a uh, generic Back parameter, today, yeah. did you um, originally do it with a generic parameter and then profile it and see, you know, this is taking too long, that looks like a place that it's taking too long, let's um, specialize yeah. that? So, so that's a great question. So in the case of column, we did it with a generic parameter. Uh, we did at specialized on it. We were using Scala 2.9 at the time, and then we read the bytecode and realized that it wasn't working. So um, reading the bytecode is definitely a skill I would recommend everybody acquire, um, because it helps you sort of tune code very, very precisely, and also find bugs in the compiler. Like the fact that at Specialized basically just doesn't work. So um, at Specialized is better now than it was six years ago, but it's still pretty terrible. So the manual specialization came out of that. There's other parts of the code where we did profile things and like, like literally just threw it into like your kid or Jake profiler and found stuff. More questions? Yes. T, T Polecat? Oh. Um, so, <laughs> I, yeah, I got a softball question for you. Um, what's, uh, you're using a lot of programming styles here, like you said, there's sort of an archaeology of trends and functional programming in Scala. Um, <laughs> and so I'm curious, what aspects of this do new people who join the team what do they find most challenging about it? Is it stuff like Matroshka that's really pushing parameterization really hard, or is it the old cake pattern stuff, or what? Nick, you wanna take that, or do you want me to like, <laughs> do you want me to put you on the spot, or do you want me to answer it? <laughs> that is completely fair. Um, okay, so uh, I would say that the, the things that I, I have to explain the most are some of the recursion scheme stuff, um, can be really, really, really heady because it's so dense. Like you've got a ton of concepts that are being expressed in like three lines. And in these three lines, magic happens. And you have to figure all of that out and sort of piece it together. It's also, recursion schemes can also be difficult because there's so much vocabulary involved and none of the vocabulary makes any sense because it's just literally random Greek words that were thrown at the page. So um, that can be really, really challenging. The cake pattern, um, I find that the problem with the cake pattern actually tends to be more when people are writing code in it. Um, if they're, you know, do sort of de novo code or like large refactorings, that sort of thing. Because the cake pattern is so fraught with, you know, initialization order issues and like trying to figure out how inheritance works and like all that stuff, that the cake pattern is really bad for that. Once it's actually up and running, for the most part it's relatively easy to trace as long as you can tag to, you know, the fifth instance of this function rather than the first instance. Um, so more, more or less that's okay. I still, I do not recommend the cake pattern. Please be sort of very clear on that. It's a bad thing to use. There are better solutions. Um, but it's not the hardest thing usually for, for people to pick up. Uh, some of the monadic stuff like giant monad transformer stacks or MTL style can be a little bit weird. Uh, and compilation time can be hard to explain because you're trying to justify why the Scala compiler is taking six minutes to compile like 11 files. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Cool. Anybody else have any questions? Is the hook coming to pull me off stage? We are out of time. Come see me later, thank you.